I've just found out what they're hiding down here. This place isn't a fortress. Hello there, everyone. This is going to be my full Star Wars Obi-Wan Kenobi Episode 4 video. There's a bunch of Easter eggs, so if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. We're doing a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships, too. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and leave your favorite Easter egg for the episode on the video. And of course, careful for spoilers for the episode if you haven't seen it yet, because we'll be talking about everything. The sound of all those fingers trying to figure out who all those different Jedi were, because some of them were featured during the Clone Wars episodes, so most of the ones that they actually focus the camera on are meant to be big Easter eggs, and I'll talk about them when we get to that part of the video. As per usual, they start the episode with the Obi-Wan Kenobi theme that John Williams created. It's meant to be a blend of that theme from A New Hope when he finds Luke Skywalker's body for the first time unfurling his hood, revealing his identity. The actual opening scene, also very WTF following up on that, is Obi-Wan Kenobi waking up from his torture at Darth Vader's hands after force choking him and dragging him through the fire. Now he's been burned like Anakin Skywalker burned on Mustafar, but not nearly as bad. Like they look like minor flesh wounds compared to what happened to Anakin Skywalker. You feel a little bit of his rage later in the episode, and you only see bits of him early in the episode too, so I'll explain, because in some parts it's Hayden Christensen as Darth Vader, and then when he's actually wearing the armor, it's actually a different actor because he's meant to be so tall, like it's a giant walking around in that armor. When he was wearing the armor, Darth Vader was about 7 meters tall, which is crazy tall. But we see Tala's character taking Obi-Wan Kenobi to their resistance base, we meet a couple of the other characters, but they have a minor ragtag crew. Mostly they use this to juxtapose his PTSD and his flashbacks to their reunion fight together with Darth Vader's flashbacks because when you see him in the back to tank for the first time, and it is the first time that we've seen Obi-Wan Kenobi actually in a back to tank, they actually directly flash between his scenes in the tank and him remembering the fight and Darth Vader's scenes in his tank in his ship. So when they're flashing to Vader in the tank, all these scenes are meant to be current present day. Like both of them are replaying the events of their reunion fight in their minds. Darth Vader still obsessed with Obi-Wan Kenobi, still trying to capture him, that's all he cares about right now, he could care less about what's happening with Leia. Remember, during this part of the timeline, he doesn't know anything about her being his daughter, so he's only thinking about Obi-Wan Kenobi. Reba is the one who captured her and is trying to find all the information about the Jedi path, the survivors of Order 66, so that the Empire will give her more props for finding all of these other Jedi survivors out there. Quinlan Vos is off there somewhere on Jabim, just waiting to come out and kick some butt. But they do confirm that Reba took Leia to the Fortress Inquisitorius. Like, literally, it's just a jump cut. Like, we're already there. If it felt like the episode moved really quickly after the events of last week's episode, it was probably the shortest episode that they have in the series. It's about the same length that you would expect from the Mandalorian episodes. Like, there's some that are really short, but usually they're closer to, like, 40, 42 minutes. You don't see the entire Fortress Inquisitorius in this episode, but they do give you a tour of some of the places that we haven't been before, obviously the biggest one being where they're housing all those Jedi that they captured. And if you did play Jedi Fallen Order, or if you've seen anything from that game, the Fortress Inquisitorius is featured heavily during that, but it's meant to be as close as possible as the version that you saw during Jedi Fallen Order. They explain it's on a moon called Nur in the Mustafar system. They call it Vader's system because, obviously, Mustafar, Revenge of the Sith references. It's meant to be a system that's very powerful in the dark side of the Force, which is one of the reasons why the Emperor wanted Darth Vader to build his castle there. The Emperor wanted Darth Vader to be more powerful. Darth Vader himself wanted to be more powerful. And one of the ways the Sith would increase their connection to the dark side of the Force is to just experience as many strong emotions as possible for as long as possible. For Darth Vader, that was to just be as angry as possible for as long as possible, which wasn't hard to do. Pretty much at every point during the original trilogy, during Rogue One, everywhere he goes, everywhere in this part of the timeline, he's full of rage. Like when he walks in and starts yelling at Reva, he's like that on the inside all the time. And even though a lot of the episode was meant to show you how Obi-Wan Kenobi is remembering a lot of his force abilities, like his technique with a lightsaber literally got better throughout the episode, scene to scene. When he's in a system like the Mustafar system that's powerful in the dark side of the force, it also weakens his connection to the light side of the force. So it'd be like running a marathon with a bunch of weights on, like it's just harder for him to do normal things that he would be doing with the force. All these early scenes of Reva interrogating Leia are meant to show you what she's like during A New Hope and mirror those scenes. Just resisting on every single level. But the other really big thing that happens during this interrogation is that Reva basically gives you all of her backstory during Order 66 and right after Order 66. If it wasn't clear, she's actually this young Jedi here during Order 66, and she basically says that she was captured. She had a droid just like Lola, as she says, but it was taken from her like everything else was taken from me. You notice she tries to reach into Leia's mind using the Force and dominate it, pick out information, find out where the hidden Jedi went. 
Obviously, the reason she can't do it the same way that she did it to Haja earlier in the series is because she's so strong in the Force and she's subconsciously using it to block Reba. There's been a couple moments during the series where Leia has subconsciously used the Force without actually thinking about the Force itself. It'll be interesting to see if she actively tries to use it at some point during the series. It's kind of like Grogu at the beginning of The Mandalorian. Grogu had forgotten a lot of his abilities, kind of like Obi-Wan had forgotten a lot of his more advanced Jedi abilities. But you don't just turn off someone's sensitivity to the Force. Like, they still have the connection to the Force, so they can still use it. It's just they can't use it in quite a refined way if they've forgotten some of their abilities. So Leia's a little bit more like Grogu at the beginning of the Mandalorian series. You have all this potential in the Force, and if you actually tried to do something, you could probably do something. But I think because they don't want to break the timeline, and Leia didn't really actively use the Force as an adult during the original trilogy, we'll see her using it in more practical, subconscious ways. Like, oh yes, she's very clearly Force-sensitive, and she's using the Force now, even if she's not thinking about actually using the Force. But when we meet the new Roken character, he calls Obi-Wan Kenobi General, so it sounds like he fought in the Clone Wars. He said that he was married to a Force-sensitive woman who the Inquisitors killed after Order 66. The way he talks about her, she was captured and either put in this orange fluid or just outright killed. When they get ready to take Obi-Wan Kenobi to the Fortress Inquisitorius and show you that gear, show you where the planet is, to kind of give you a once-over tutorial about what's going on with the fortress itself. Like, oh, it's in the Mustafar system, but it's not on Mustafar. That's just to differentiate it from the actual Vader's castle, because Vader's castle's on Mustafar, but the Fortress Inquisitorius is on one of the moons nearby. He also says Darth Vader stayed on his ship behind. I think that was for a couple reasons. Narratively, he's staying behind on his ship to stay in his back to tank to regenerate because he needs to. Also because he's waiting for Obi-Wan Kenobi to come out of hiding visibly so that he can go after him again and recapture him. And also I think on a more practical level, to keep Darth Vader as far away from Leia as possible, at least young Leia, so that they don't interact too much. I'll talk about that in the next couple of episodes too, because I do expect them to share at least a very brief scene. It would be weird if they don't share at least one really small scene. Either way, I think that's the reason why he doesn't show up at the fortress till the very end of the episode after they've already taken off. There's a whole funny scene with them trying to break into the Fortress Inquisitorius. Tala says that she can use her older codes. That's meant to be a reference for Return of the Jedi, where they break into the Force Moon of Endor using the older codes. When Tala helps him break in underwater to the fortress, that's meant to be an Easter egg for both Phantom Menace when he's swimming to the Gungan City underwater and to Fallen Order because you enter the fortress underwater. A lot of you also asking about the timeline too. The events of Jedi Fallen Order also take place around 10 years or so after Revenge of the Sith, so it's around the same time period. They said that the whole running storyline with Obi-Wan Kenobi on his search and rescue mission, slowly regaining his Force abilities or remembering his Force techniques. Now, he's not remembering how to be connected to the Force. You don't forget that. But that's what he means when he says, you don't forget something like that, like you don't forget the Force. It's a bit like riding a bicycle, and it's the same thing for Grogu for the most part too. Like, he was only with Luke Skywalker for a very brief period during Book of Boba Fett, but Luke said that he managed to remember most of all the teachings that he forgot over the years. That's why by the end of the episode, when he's fighting against the Stormtroopers, he's swinging his lightsaber around deflecting blaster shots like it's no big deal. For those of you that were worried about him not being skilled during the last big reunion fight that they had in Episode 3, you can kind of see what they're doing with this too, is it means that the next time that he and Darth Vader have a rematch, he will be much more skilled and it'll be much more like their fight, the technique during their fight during Revenge of the Sith. But that's basically what Obi-Wan is doing throughout the episode, especially these early parts, is just trying to use the Force in small ways to sort of remember things. One of the other interesting things that you notice here, though, is that as Tala is breaking in, going past the security guard, she lies to him about the Grand Inquisitor. He does not seem to know anything about him being dead. Deborah Chow and the other people that worked on the show said that canon is very important to them, and the Inquisitor is still alive later in the timeline. So I think when they were trying to answer these questions about the Inquisitor potentially being dead, they were trying to say, no, 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 don't worry. We secretly did not kill him. He's going to come back in a really big way by the finale. So that's an early prediction right now, is that we'll see some big WTF reveal in the end with the Inquisitor coming back. Sort of like Anakin Skywalker coming back as Darth Vader. Like, you'd be surprised at what a Sith warrior can survive. That's also probably why Reba got him with a gut shot instead of a head shot. Everyone posting their Thanos memes, you should have gone for the head. There are a couple new characters that we haven't seen in earlier episodes before. I don't think that we saw Death Troopers before, but we do see them during Rogue One later in the timeline. And we see a Seeker droid, and I think that's the first time on the series that they've shown a Seeker droid. It just looks like a smaller pro droid. It does have a stun weapon that it tries to get him with later. When Reba is interrogating Leia, also trying to get her to continue to lose hope, she keeps telling her, the people you care about will never come save you. No one is coming for you. It's all meant to be her trying to use her own fear, like Reba's fear as a child, against Leia. 
So it's meant to reveal how Reba wound up turning to the dark side of the force and becoming an inquisitor and why she hates these Jedi survivors so much, the people that survived Order 66, because at the time when she was captured after Order 66, the Jedi Inquisitors at that time, or the fallen Jedi working with the Emperor who worked to create the Inquisitorius, used all that same fear against her, trying to twist her against the other Jedi, saying that all these other Jedi ran, they don't care about you at all, so why should you care about them? At least in Reva's case, she turned to the dark side and now she's hunting them down, because she resents what they did not do coming to help save her. The whole point of the series is to flow into New Hope, to show Obi-Wan Kenobi finding New Hope, like he's meant to start the series at his lowest point. It's also meant to be a parallel for Reva's story too, I think. Even though it seems like she's about to get her comeuppance from someone like the other Inquisitors hate her, Darth Vader seems like he hates her now, the Grand Inquisitor definitely wants to kill her. Even if she survives by the end, it sounds like she will also find some new hope towards the end of the series. Leia lying to her too, trying to use her father against her, is just trying to show her resisting more, more practical resistance, like resisting through the force because she can't read her mind, but also being stubborn enough to just not give that information up. But when Obi-Wan Kenobi finds the wing where they're keeping all those Jedi, he uses a special cylinder to open it. Those are the cylinders that you see on all the Imperial uniforms. Sometimes they'll have multiple cylinders on their uniforms. Those are meant to be code cylinders that will give them access to special hidden areas or special databases. It's like when you see R2-D2 sticking his arm into other computers to access them. It's the same thing for Imperials, but they use those small cylinders. This is probably the most WTF part of the episode, though, is him finding all the bodies of these Jedi. The very first Jedi that he sees here is actually Jedi Master Terra Sunube, who showed up during the Clone Wars episodes that a lot of you might remember. He's notable because his lightsaber was disguised as his walking stick, so he's able to walk around hiding his true power. Probably the most WTF reveal here, though, is the Jedi youngling who's still in his gear from the Jedi Temple in Order 66. Like, they literally just stuck him inside this facility after the end of Order 66. Let me know if you think you know who all these other Jedi are. Now, there are a couple different rows. They don't show us every single row. So you have to imagine that it's pretty much most of the Jedi. And it sounds like everybody that Darth Vader captures, the Inquisitors capture, that they just stick in here. The other reason why Darth Vader kept them like this is to keep them like trophies, just like their lightsabers that they took off of them when the Inquisitors captured them. If you look in the background, there are two different display cases on both sides of the door. Those are the lightsabers that they took off of the Jedi that are inside this facility. Reva putting little Leia, a little 10 year old girl, on this wicked looking torture device here is just meant to give you echoes for a new hope of her being tortured by Darth Vader. But eventually with a little bit of help from Tala who tries to distract Reba, Obi-Wan Kenobi is able to save her using the darkness and you do see his Jedi abilities slowly becoming stronger throughout these scenes and through their hallway escape. They do this really cool thing too where they try to illuminate them only using the red light from the floor. It's meant to give you very Sith echoes. Red is a very dark Jedi, very Sith color. So you see red lights casting red shadows on everything all over the Fortress Inquisitorius. Tala gives us a really big Easter egg in connection to Star Wars Rebels, also to the Clone Wars. When she says the Rebels are actually on Florum, it's actually meant to be a big callback to Leia lying about the Rebels being on Dantooine, when really they were on Yavin 4. But also, this is a callback to the Clone Wars, to Star Wars Rebels, because Florum is a planet that Hondo comes from. The scene of Obi-Wan Kenobi holding off the stormtroopers in the hallway fight as the glass starts to crack is also pretty cool. His ability with a lightsaber seems like it's getting closer and closer to what it was during Revenge of the Sith. The other big connection here too is if you played Jedi Fallen Order, one of the ways they escaped Darth Vader during that game in the Fortress Inquisitorius is by breaking the glass and flooding the area, just distracting Vader for a little while while they get away. This time, though, they actually bring back around that big snowspeeder easter egg from earlier when Obi-Wan Kenobi says you have a bunch of T-47s, oh, but they've been retrofitted to carry a bunch of sewage. Those are the same ships that are the snowspeeders from Empire Strikes Back. R.I.P. Wade, though, who winds up eating a bunch of energy cells when Reva force pushes them into him. They also have a funny callback to A New Hope with the mouse droid that bites it during this fight scene. Then they finally bring back Darth Vader, like I said, for a couple reasons. I think mostly just to keep him away from Leia until the later episodes. Reva only saving herself from being force choked into oblivion by revealing that she placed a tracker on Layla's Lola droid. At the beginning of the episode, they were talking about taking them to Jabim, so it sounds like that's where they're going in this episode. But remember, at this point in the timeline, they're not called the Rebels, they're not like this unified force of figures yet, they're just like a couple pockets of resistance all over the galaxy, trying to work together, helping each other. During the events of the Andor Rogue One prequel series, we'll see the Rebellion actually come together. But again, I think the big thing here is them swerving on having Leia interact with Darth Vader in any scenes or them being in proximity to each other. That is, I think, until the later episodes. Like, it would be weird if they don't at least share a small scene together. 
The other weird thing of note during the episode is when Reva spent all that time interrogating Leia, you'd think that she would sense that Leia was force sensitive, Leia just going full stealth in the force I guess, mostly for continuity plot armor's sake though I think. Like they didn't want the Empire finding out that Leia was a force sensitive character because then that would have caused bigger problems later in the timeline. The whole thing with Leia smiling and grabbing Obi-Wan Kenobi's hand, looking at him, him smiling back, is meant to foreshadow his renewed hope. Like I said, the series is all about him finding new hope again for the future. It's a bit of a double meaning though, like the title A New Hope means a lot of different things, like it's a reference to Obi-Wan Kenobi's hope, it's a reference to Luke Skywalker himself, to Leia, because she's also a new hope for the galaxy, but also a new hope that Anakin Skywalker will resurface inside Darth Vader and redeem himself somehow. So it's like a reference to like four different things. Just to clarify too, the reason why you see Hayden Christensen's name in the credits, even though you don't see a ton of him, is because anytime Darth Vader is out of the armor in the back to anytime it's like an actual human body that you're seeing, that is Hayden Christensen wearing that makeup. And when you hear Darth Vader's voice as James Earl Jones, they're actually using the same trick they use for Luke Skywalker's voice during the Book of Boba Fett episodes more recently. I will tolerate your weakness no longer. What you're hearing is a digital recreation of James Earl Jones' voice in a computer, sort of like a cobbled together version of his voice made up out of nothingness. So James Earl Jones, who's in his 90s now, still doing great, did not come in to record this new dialogue. It was the same thing for Mark Hamill and Luke Skywalker during Book of Boba Fett. Mark Hamill said, I did not record any new dialogue. They did all that in a computer. The whole thing now though is that the Inquisitors and Darth Vader are going to try and follow the tracker to Jabim and find their resistance base wherever they're hiding out. For those of you hoping for a Quinlan Voss cameo scene, because the way that Tala talked about him, he was a big part of this underground Jedi railroad. If you spotted any big easter eggs in the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments. My full Obi-Wan Kenobi episode 5 video will post next week just like normal. Because there's so much big stuff happening today and starting today, my next big video will be for the Black Adam trailer and then my full Miss Marvel episode 1 video will post. Miss Marvel will also be a weekly series, but what'll happen is because they both post on the same day is I'll do my Obi-Wan Kenobi episode videos first because there's only a couple left and then I'll post my Miss Marvel videos. Make sure to enable alerts for my channel so you don't miss anything. There's so much big stuff happening this summer. All my links for my Marvel episode videos are down in the description below and my Obi-Wan Kenobi bonus videos. Everyone click here for that brand new Black Adam trailer video. I'll update the link as soon as I post it and click here for my Qui-Gon Jinn Easter egg video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe and I'll see you guys in the next one.